So Pete Kelly here is, is uh, was kind enough. I, I found him last year through some uh, colleagues, uh, historical society folks, people interested in the history. And they said, I said, hey, can you guys talk to us about the history of Avila and, and all this and that? And he said, sure. And he said, but have you talked to Pete? It's like, uh, who the hell's Pete? Like, well, you got to talk to Pete. If you, if you want to talk to anything about history in this area, you got to talk to Pete. I don't know, Pete. So they, they kindly connected us. And uh, last year, he was kind enough to come down and, and, and regale us with some of the history here. And so, uh, and so without further ado, Pete, so these guys, they know a little, they just know a little teeny bit about the area, but we're learning about it in the okay. context of management. And so, so you can talk to us whatever you want, but in particular, want to hear about how the city has changed over time. Okay. Now, what, over 12,000 years ago, and this was this Avila area, was the largest Chumash settlement north of Point Conception, okay? Well, you know, they were, had their Chumash villages and things were going along, and then, of course, the Spanish showed up. And uh, that period lasted till the 1820s when it became the Mexican period. And during the Mexican period, but during the Spanish and Mexican period, this was always a port. And I've uncovered records of ships pulling into Avila really early. As a matter of fact, you know that if you know what the uh, Filipino galleon trades were, where these galleons went from like San Blas in Mexico all the way across to the Philippines, and then when they sailed back, they would hit Northern California. And that was, uh, we're talking about late 1500, 1590, ships from that trade came into Avalon. As a matter of fact, they had natives from the Philippines who were called Luzon, escaped from their ship and joined with the Chumash Indians. So can you believe that? Here's Filipinos with Chumash Indians here in Avalon. Well, then things went along and steel ships were coming in. And this was a stop for, uh, you know, in the two years before the mast era when everybody was trading in California hides, well, ships would come in here because there were big ranches here, right? There was the, the ranches that used this area were the Dana Adobe and Napomo. Um, or the Dana Ranch, the Napomo Ranch. This was San Miguelito, Rancho San Miguelito. There was uh, other ranches in the Arroyo Grande area, and they would all bring their hides, or California dollars, to Pirate's Cove, which is about a mile away from here. And that's where the ships would come in once a year, like in two years before the mast, and they would uh, trade their hides for goods that they needed, you know thread, needles, all that stuff they couldn't produce here. Then, and also at that same, at this point right here, which we, they call different names, right now you call it Fossil Point, that used to be a point where the Chumash could do smoke signals all the way to Point Conception. See, if you look right there past Point Sol and past that, that's Vandenberg. And when those missiles take off, we can see them perfectly here. As a matter of fact, you can feel the rumble in Avila when those missiles take off. Okay, so they were sending smoke signals over there. And then also when the ship came into Pirate's Cove to let the ranchers know it was in, they would send smoke signals from right up there also. Okay. So things were going along and there was otter hunters which were these hunters that first were hunting beavers inland, mountain men. But they came out here to hunt otters. And the reason why was you got $35 for an otter pelt, but only five for a um, beaver pelt. So otter hunters came out here and then ships would come down with the Russian, American ships with Russian crews and Inuit Indians from Alaska would come down here and hunt otters, and they'd also hunt the local Indians, especially on the Channel Islands. You guys, I'm sure, know about, what was her name, Juana Maria, the last woman of San Nicolas Island. 
That's a whole fascinating story in itself, especially the guy that rescued her, Nye Devon, which is down in your area towards Carpinteria. At any rate, so we were going along. Then, of course, General Fremont came through here with his buckskin army, and the war with Mexico started, and this, uh, this area became eventually, first in 1848 as a territory, then 1850 as a state, okay? So, there was still a lot of commerce, ships coming into port here. But, where we really lucked out, or didn't luck out, depending on your point of view, is we built, we first had a wharf off Pirate's Cove, or a landing, that's where the boats would land. Then they built a wharf a block down, they called it People's Wharf, and that was a large wharf and big ships could come in. This was about 1869. Then they decided, well, it's better to move the port over to what we call Port Harford because it's protected from the swell and the wind. So they did that and they built a narrow gauge railroad. So now we had a narrow gauge railroad it eventually got to San Luis, and then eventually went from San Luis all the way down to Los Olivos. You know where Los Olivos is? That was the end of the line. You couldn't go from Avila to Los Olivos, but you could go from Avila to San Luis and then to Los Olivos. So that was really a big, big deal because the only way farmers got their products to market was through ships at that time. And so, Ships would come in here and they would take sheep, they would take cheese, they'd take butter, they'd take everything. And that went along and then right down by Orchid, they started looking for oil and they hit this huge gusher called Old Mod. That's an Orchid. And Old Mod was just an incredible amount of oil. So this Narrow Gauge Railroad Company, Pacific Steamship Line, bought 40 tankers to fit the narrow gauge because their tracks happened to go right by Old Mod. So these tankers were being loaded up with oil twice a day, coming to Avila, and the oil was being shipped out. And when did that start, Pete? What year was that? That started in just around 1900, let's okay. say. Okay, then... One company built a huge port over in what we call Shell Beach, which is about three miles away from here. And they called that oil port. And they built a pier going way out in the refinery and tanks and all that. Well, a huge ocean swell, like surfers say a swell, you know, meaning a series of big waves. A huge swell came in, destroyed that pier. And this pier was just, was just built. But it didn't destroy this pier. It was really funny. So that's how Union Oil came to Avila. Okay, now Union Oil came to Avila. They where it's now the Cal Poly Pier, that next pier over. That was the Union Oil Pier, and Avila became. Oh, and then they built the pipeline from Taft to the San Joaquin Valley to San Luis, then Avila. And that was in the movie, Let There Be Blood. Have you ever seen that movie? That's about that pipeline to Avila. Okay, we became the world's largest oil exporting port in the world. We were like Kuwait. At one time, 100 ships came into Port San Luis. Okay, so that went along. So now we were kind of like an oil town. Union Oil built housing on the road as you're coming in. Big money. Big money. Yeah, big money and doing a lot of oil. And uh, so that's basically, we were now an oil port. And that was running along and a lot of people moved to Avila and the Avila school was built and things were going along. Then, of course, the Japanese got a lot of their oil from Avila. So Japanese tankers were coming into Avila all the way up until three months before Pearl Harbor, okay? Plus, and this area had a lot of ja Japanese-American truck farmers. In other words, they were leasing land 
all the way out past Diablo, right over here in Pirates Cove. These were all Japanese American farmers. Well, World War II broke out, and two weeks after Pearl Harbor, there was a Japanese submarine out here. The Japanese had the best submarines in the world, and they had about a dozen of them. And they were at ports from San Diego to British Columbia. One of them was here in Estero Bay because of the oil that came out here. Okay, that's the reason for World War II is we cut the Japanese off from oil and they needed oil to run their military machine. Okay, so there was an oil tanker, the Montebello, pulled into Avila two weeks after Pearl Harbor and the skipper of the Montebello said, hey, guess what? I'm not gonna sail this load of oil up to Vancouver, British Columbia, unless I get a naval escort. Well, they went, well, we don't have a naval escort. So they took the assistant skipper, became the skipper. It was a big, you know, occupational raise for him. Well, they were sunk let's say between Cambry and Cayucas by a Japanese submarine. And we'll see that photo tonight where we stay. The, yeah. the, the, the news, the headline from the newspaper. Right, so no one was killed fortunately. And uh, they also had a plan that on Christmas day of 1941, the Japanese submarine, which was also capable of launching an airplane, believe it or not, was gonna blow up the Union Oil Pier and the tank farm. Up on this hill was a huge tank farm, which I'll get to later. But anyway, they were gonna blow them up, which would have caused quite a commotion in Avila. We would still be talking about it, but they decided not to because they didn't want to risk their submarine. And that very submarine fought until 1944 when it was sunk in the Pacific. So, after and the Yacht Club became part of the Navy. After World War II, they gave the Yacht Club back to the Yachters, and uh, they had torn down the railroad tracks for the narrow gauge railroad because they needed the iron for surplus. Big mistake. If we had that railroad still running from San Luis Obispo to Avila, it would have solved a lot of parking problems and other things. But at any rate, it was torn down. The right-of-way was sold off. And so then Union Oil was moving along. We weren't the biggest port anymore, but what basically would happen here was, this is 50s and 60s, tankers would pull into the Union Oil Pier. They would unload refined product, meaning regular diesel, ethyl, all that. It would go up to this tank farm up on the hill, and then trucks would come up and fill up with that, then they'd take it to gas stations. So when I first moved here, I remember seeing all these beautiful Union Oil trucks were always going up Front Street, you know, picking it up and then going. Okay. Meanwhile, I know an old timer, there's, his dad worked at the pier and his uncle worked up at the tank farm and the pier would call up, there'd be a tanker and they'd go, send me 100,000 gallons of diesel. So they'd go, roger that, and they'd sit. there were 13 pipes running down Front Street here to the Union Oil Pier. Across that bridge, you can still see them underneath that bridge. So they would go call up and say, did you get that oil, that diesel we sent down? <laughs> they'd go, well, we got 99,000 gallons, meaning 1,000 gallons had leaked on the way. But they didn't care because they were doing so much oil, you know what I mean? So, in the probably, let's say, 1980, meanwhile, there had been a, uh, a water moratorium in Avalis so no one could build. But then they started lifting that moratorium. And some of the property owners here on Front Street decided to build, so they had to do a soil test. And the whole area was oil underneath. If you dug it down three feet, okay? So, lawsuits happened and everything, and all that stuff happened, and then Union Oil was forced to clean up the town. So from 
the end of town, way down there, to over here, San Luis Street. This is San Miguel. The next one's San Luis Street. And one block back, everything was torn down. The only thing they didn't tear down, they moved the grocery store and they moved the yacht club. Everything else was torn down. They did the 100,000 dump truck trips, dug up all the soil, put in new soil, and then eventually they got rid of all their tanks up here at the tank farm, which uh, the only tanks left are the water tanks for our town, right? And by that time, there was a lot of commercial fishing going on in Avila, and then they started to build the nuclear power plant, which that was the biggest job in 11 Western states. So there were a lot of people employed when they were building Diablo Canyon. And uh, that caused controversy in the town. And I don't know if you guys know it, but there were a lot of people that didn't want the plant there. And there were actually 3,000 people arrested at the uh, gates of Diablo because they were trying to blockade the area. Then that passed and the, the plant went online. Then is when they started digging up the town about 1990. And Union Oil acquired most of the property. And then after they cleaned it all up, they sold a lot of the property. And so this is what you see right now. This is all new stuff, except for the Yacht Club and part of the grocery store. At any rate, so that happened and uh, now here we are, all these years later, and they were going to close Diablo Canyon. Now it looks like they're going to keep Ten it more open years. for a while. Ten more years. Yeah, and so that's uh, that's a controversy around here, you know. People are concerned, but that's the way it goes. And the way I look at it is, shoot, we were the number one oil exporting place. Diablo Canyon was supplying. 11% of PG&E's electricity. The Topaz Solar Farm on the Crease of Plains was the other 11% of PG&E's electricity. But yet we pay the highest in the country for gas. They should be giving it to us. <laughs> you know what I mean? But for some reason they don't. <laughs> Why that happens, I don't know. But at any rate, and then of course, you know, in San Luis Obispo, they had a huge tank farm where all this oil from San Joaquin Valley would be stored in San Luis before they'd ship it to Avila. And it caught fire in a lightning storm in 1925. And the creek burnt from San Luis to, this is the same creek that runs in front of Mission Plaza, burnt from San Luis to Avila for two weeks. And it was the lar world's largest man-made disaster. And these were huge, huge. They held 15,000 barrels. Each one was like double Exxon Valdez or something of these huge, huge pits in the ground that they covered tanks. So anyway, and so here we are right now. There we are. Here we are. Awesome. Questions for Pete? 